Hello, sir. Okay. Yes. Uh, give me an option to record. Okay. Okay, you can record now. <coughs> okay, so we were uh, looking at the effect of nuclear uh, uh, multiple expansion uh, for and looking at both electric multiple and uh, magnetic multiple contribution. We uh, actually looked at magnetic dipole and we showed that the electric dipole does not contribute because the nuclear uh, Hamiltonian is parity invariant and electric dipole is parity odd. But electric quadrupole does, and we basically did this expansion and we said that, like, this is the quadrupole moment of the <clears throat> nucleus, and this would uh, contribute to the energy splitting in the uh, electronic problem. Okay, so of course one has to compute this matrix element in nuclear ground state, and for which we used uh, for which we used the Wigner-Eckert theorem to say that to interpret that um, the quadruple moment is a, a tensor operator, and we write down this second rank tensor operator in terms of uh, uh, product of um, vector operators and we uh, kind of utilize that fact to compute the energy correction. Okay, so this is what we did. Uh, we wrote QIJ in terms of symmetric traceless uh, product of uh, the uh, nuclear angular momentum and we computed this matrix element uh, to compute the contribution due to electric quadruple moment of the nucleus. So, so this kind of computation was, of course, done uh, uh, in kind of uh, two steps. One was the angular part of the involving the nuclear angular momenta, and then there was a radial part in, involving the, uh, the electronic uh, coordinates, and one could uh, do these two computations independently. Okay, fine. <coughs> So uh, we also, of course, uh, looked at uh, possible splitting of this uh, Hamiltonian and tried to see under which condition would be used degenerate perturbation theory versus non-degenerate perturbation theory. And this, of course, uh, amounts to asking the question that what is the energy splitting between two energy levels that are under consideration versus the energy contributed by the perturbation Hamiltonian delta H. Okay, and uh, in one case, when uh, the contribution of delta H is small compared to the energy split, then you treat this problem as non-degenerate perturbation theory problem. But if delta H is large compared to the energy splitting, then you uh, essentially consider this as a degenerate perturbation theory problem. Okay, so, so that was one of the points that we uh, covered last time. Okay, that if the splitting is small, then you treat that as a degenerate perturbation theory problem. But if the splitting is very large, then you treat this as a non-degenerate perturbation theory problem. Individual energy levels are corrected by the matrix element of delta H. Okay. Fine. So today, what we look at is the uh, effect of uh, external uniform magnetic field uh, and try, we'll try to study how the spectrum would change if you apply uh, say uniform uh, magnetic field say in that direction since magnetic field is a vector it, it has a direction and uh, most suitable direction to study is the z direction okay uh, we know from the non-relativistic expansion, the foldy Wuthuizen expansion, that uh, the magnetic field couples to L plus 2s factor. So that is that would be the perturbation Hamiltonian. And uh, we will uh, kind of study this system. Okay, we will of course assume that the magnetic field is uh, 
uh, uniform. Okay, so that uh, barring its direction, it it will just contribute a constant quantity uh, b, uh, where we are choosing the magnetic field to be in z direction with magnitude b. Okay, now because the magnetic field is in z direction, l plus two s only the z component of that is relevant, and that's why the Hamiltonian is in terms of l plus two s. Okay, now. Now there are of course two possibilities. Either the magnitude of this magnetic field B, the magnitude B is very large, or it could be very small. So let's start with the small magnetic field. Okay, so this is a problem of what is called the weak magnetic field problem. Okay, and in this case, of course, uh, energy splitting generated by B would be much less compared to the fine structure splitting. Uh, and in that case, you basically treat this problem as non-degenerate perturbation theory. Uh, uh, type problem, okay. Uh, although we will see as to you know how we are, we are going to treat this problem, okay. But uh, uh, at least fine structure splitting. Uh, remember, fine structure splitting is, uh, is those uh, correspond to those corrections which you know Schrodinger could not get it right using the the so-called Klein-Gordon equation. Uh, so th there are some factors constant sitting around outside and inside the bracket you have terms something like mm, n upon j plus half uh, minus three quarters and mm, uh, Schrodinger got n upon j plus one or something like that uh, times uh, uh, minus three quarters and that that is the kind of term that we are talking about which gives fine sp uh, structure splitting. The, the reason why it is called fine structure splitting is because mm, because the original hydrogen atom problem problem depended only on the principle, the energy spectrum depended only on the principal quantum number. But in this case, you can clearly see that you have n upon j plus half. So different j values would have different energy contribution uh, uh, due to the relativistic correction. And therefore, you call uh, those contributions as fine structure splitting, okay? If your magnetic field is small, such that the fine structure splitting is much larger than the, uh, the splitting generated by the magnetic field, then we are basically going to treat this problem as non-degenerate perturbation theory problem, okay? Now, uh, of course, fine structure splitting does not split the spectrum completely. Uh, it it has factors like n upon j plus half, but the projections of j, uh, which are like, which are magnetic quantum number mj, uh, those are still degenerate. So it's not like the problem is totally non-degenerate perturbation theory problem, but with respect to the original hydrogen atom problem, the fine structure splitting has already kind of reduced the degeneracy. Okay, so in that sense, it is not degenerate perturbation theory. Okay, now of course, because the uh, fine structure uh, correction has introduced J into the energy spectrum, N upon J plus half, uh, the right kind of basis to work with is uh, NLS JM basis and not NLS MLMS basis. NLS MLMS basis would have been good if we had we are doing quantum. The original hydrogen atom problem that we did in Schrodinger equation uh, case, but um, uh, in that case, of course, in uh, uh, LS JM basis also would have been equally good. Okay, but fine structure uh, correction has selected the basis. Uh, unequivocally because of j plus half sitting in the denominator and that basis is this one and l s equals half because we are looking at a single electron problem okay uh, j m okay and of course j takes values half three half dot 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 all the way up to n minus half okay and we also know that uh, you know, n minus half has lesser degeneracy than uh, other ones okay fine uh, so this is that statement that n minus half comes from only L is percent minus one. Okay, fine. Now this basis of course is diagonal uh, for uh, J and JZ and uh, JZ eigenvalue is just, just MJ. Okay, so, uh, so one can use this fact now. Remember we have a JZ uh, we have L plus 2S, which can also be written as J plus S, and which is for the uh, 
magnetic field in z direction would give you jz plus z okay and uh, uh, so so in this particular case jz of course is diagonal and you can determine its eigen value but z is not well defined quantum number in this uh, uh, basis because the right kind of basis for that would be uh, the what we would call the mlms basis okay uh, so what happens is that like you know we have to compute this matrix element uh, and what we'll do is we'll insert complete set of mlms basis in between such that we can compute as the eigen value uh, inside the mlms basis okay so uh, let's go through the motion uh, so, uh, so that we can actually try to figure out a method which is simpler than what we will uh, uh, study right now okay uh, of course we'll look at the simpler method also okay so, so as i said uh, to get quantum numbers uh, to get states in which z is diagonal we will have to make a switch from this basis to mlms basis okay so by mlms basis i mean you write down all kinds of stuff like n l s m l m s kind of stuff but uh, n l uh, s values are not going to change so therefore i don't really write uh, those terms Uh, just to avoid some uh, clutter out here, and uh, what you get is something like this: that the left-hand side state has a ML prime, MS prime sandwich in between. Then you have the operator, and then you have a ML MS sandwich between the the ket state and the S state. Okay. <coughs> Good. Now this matrix element. Uh, It has, I mean, SJ is diagonal in this uh, basis, and because of because SJ is diagonal, it will give you eigenvalue MS, and it will also tell you that MS prime is equal to MS because that is that is purely coming from the orthogonality condition. Okay, so because MS prime is equal to MS and ML prime is equal to ML, simply because SJ commutes with the magnetic quantum number for the orbital angular momentum, the the state here is same as the state here. Okay, but if this state and this state is same, and this state and this state is same, and this state and this state is same, then you might as well say that like S Z actually does not change the uh, S quantum number, okay, M S quantum number, okay. So that is what we get, okay, that M L equals M L prime and M S equals M S prime, okay. Now we need not have done all this had we realized uh, something else, and that is that. Jz and Sz actually commute, okay? Because Sz commutes with itself and Sz commutes with Lz, okay? And therefore Sz commutes with Jz. If that is the case, then this experience tells you that Ms quantum number is not changing, Ml quantum number is not changing because of Sz. So therefore, you you know that S is not going to change the Mj quantum number, okay? Because Mj, after all, Mj is just Ml plus Ms. If Sz does not change Ms value and Sz does not change Ml value, then Sz Sz does does not change Mj value also. Okay, fine. In addition, L and S act on different Hilbert spaces, and therefore L squared and Sz commute. Okay, fine. So therefore, the L prime, which is on the left hand side of this uh, uh, state. Or maybe you can go back here. L prime written out here and L written out here, they must be same simply because S Z cannot change L value. S Z commutes with L squared. Okay. So as a result, the state on the left and the state on the right is essentially same. Okay, because M J and M J prime are same. S and J are same anyway. L and L prime are also same. Okay, so the state. so is that is actually being sandwiched between the same state okay and we know that is that is not going to change the value of l is that is not change the, going to change the value of j and nor is it going to change the value of mj okay good so so what we'll do is we'll use wigner eckert theorem to figure out what that matrix element is okay so what we want to do is we want to find this matrix element which is what i just explained that left the the bra and ket states are exactly identical okay although initially it was not the situation 
this was L prime and I am MJ prime. But uh, after this manipulation, we discover that it's the same state in which SZ is sandwiched. Okay. So what we'll do is we will use wigner eckhart theorem to determine this matrix element. Okay. So what does wigner eckhart theorem tells us? wigner eckhart theorem tells us that if you have a vector operator sandwiched between the state, I mean, not vector, any, any spherical tensor operator, but right now we have a vector operator. So if you have a vector operator stand sandwiched between the states, then that vector operator is given by a reduced matrix element between those states uh, whose dependence on the magnetic quantum number uh, is, has been already stripped off. There is no dependence. The reduced matrix element does not depend on the magnetic quantum number. And this reduced matrix element is multiplied by the cleft gordon coefficient. The cleft gordon coefficient has uh, satisfied two conditions in general, nothing to do with wigner eckhart theorem or this manipulation, purely Lie algebraic uh, uh, result, that the magnetic quantum number should add up uh, correctly, that uh, mj, uh, or, or let, let's go back to this thing, if you write down wigner eckhart kind of stuff here, then the a z value of uh, this operator has some m uh, magnetic quantum number. That magnetic quantum number plus m j should be equal to m j prime. Okay. Now, of course, we are choosing it to be a z in this particular case whose magnetic quantum number is actually zero. But uh, that is just uh, uh, that, that is just the case for this particular matrix element. But in general, you, you may have some other operator sitting there which may have magnetic projection. Then Wigner Eckhart, sorry, Clef Gordon coefficient tells you that Mj prime has to be sum of magnetic projection of this operator plus this magnetic projection. And L prime should be vector addition of the angular momentum or spherical uh, rank of the spherical tensor of this and the L value here. Okay. That Okay, so, so L prime has to sit inside the uh, vector addition of these two uh, operators. Okay, fine. So let's do that. Okay, so here's the statement. This is what we want to compute. N L S J M J times S Z N L S J M J. Okay, that is equal to N L S J M J information is gone. Reduce matrix element of for S now, this is part of the uh, thing that you put in a vector operator up, uh, inside the reduced matrix element, okay, where this one is actually one of the components of that vector operator. And of course, the same state N L S J, okay. Whole thing is multiplied by the Clef's Gordon coefficient, okay. Now notice this Clef's Gordon coefficient, the two states are, the, both the bra and ket have the same J value. SZ is a vector operator, that's why one, okay? Ra and Ket both have same MJ value, so that is why MJ, MJ. And SZ is the Z component of the vector operator, whose, of course, magnetic uh, quantum number is zero. That's why it's zero, okay? So J, one, J, MJ, zero, MJ, okay? And, of course, they both satisfy the requirements for the clefs gordon coefficient to be non-vanishing, namely, uh, one plus j does contain uh, j in the uh, in the vector addition, okay. And similarly, zero plus m j, uh, of course, is equal to m j, okay. So is it fine? Oh, why do we have one over there? It should be. Oh, it it is the spin value, yes. right? Yeah, but as far as the uh, angular momentum algebra is concerned, it's a vector, no? S x s y z. Um, right. Okay. So that's why that's why one. Okay. I so and the, and the zero corresponds to z direction. Zero because this is a z component, no? Yeah. Uh, S x plus i x y is one. S x minus i x y is minus one, and s z is zero. Okay. That's why one zero. Is it okay? Uh, would you scroll up? Yes, yes, sure. Further? 
So we put the rank yeah, of yeah. the spherical tensor upstairs. So yes, yes, of course. That's always the that's the class garden notation, no? Yeah. So that is the reason for one. Oh yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. So so J J one J is this is or uh, maybe upstairs here. This J is this J. This J is this J. Okay, you could have had different values. Maybe J prime and J. Then it would have been J prime J, and the operator uh, rank sits in the middle. Okay, that's how the Klebsch gardens are written. Yeah, Kosto wanted me to go up, uh, above somewhere. Yeah, somewhere yeah. here. Yeah. I mean, this expression is the same as that, right? Uh, this expression. Uh, uh, oh yeah, eventually. Yeah, of course, of course, yeah. This expression is same as that. This we went through this expression just to learn. Uh, I mean, you know, if we knew it, of course, we need not have done it this way. That's why I said there's a simpler way of doing it. But you see, anytime you see SZ, you would naturally go to MLMS basis. So that's why we went through this MLMS basis to learn that SZ does not change ML value and it does not change MS value. So then we might as well directly work in the uh, JM basis and not work in MLMS basis. So this was a, just a step to kind of show you that uh, we could directly work here. And but but if you want to work in LS JM basis, okay, like this basis, okay, then it is not immediately obvious what is the eigenvalue of SZ, okay, because SZ uh, quantum number is not a Good quantum number in this basis. Okay, so we will use Wigner Eckert to extract that information. Okay, so that is why Wigner Eckert. So, in some sense, you know, you may want to go through this exercise if you don't want to use Wigner Eckert. You know, uh, in the sense that, like, you know, this exercise involves a Klebsch Gordon sitting here and a Klebsch Gordon sitting here, and this is just a simple matrix element. Okay, and then you, of course, have to sum over all possible values, but you know which are the what are the values which are going to contribute? The values which are going to contribute are the ones where ML and I, ML prime is same and MS and MS prime are same. Okay, so uh, so nothing wrong in doing a calculation this way. What we are trying to do here is that we will kind of you know consolidate our confidence in using Wigner Eckert theorem by doing this. Okay. Yeah, but which of uh, evaluating the reduced matrix element is still yeah. we still have to do what we have done above. Uh, this one. Yeah, because in how do we yeah. evaluate that reduced element? Okay, we'll go ahead and we'll see how we do that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we will we'll get it without changing the basis. That is the that is the game in the Wigner Eckert theorem. Okay. Yes, sir. And one more thing. Yes. This reduced matrix element uh, N L S G S N L S G. Yeah. This should not depend on L, right? Because uh, in the end, uh, S is not talking to L. Yeah, yeah. So it doesn't, it, well, it depends on L, of course. Okay. But uh, S is not changing the L value. Yeah. So it can depend on L. No, no, no. No, no. We will see it will depend on the L actually. Okay. Because you see, okay. J is a vector addition of L and S, no? Okay. Yeah. So, so when you will compute this matrix element, you will see that there is a L appearing. Let's go ahead. You'll see what happens. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Is that fine? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, but so far it is fine, right? Yeah. We have just used Wigner Eckert theorem to say that it is this matrix element has. The geometric piece, which is the magnetic quantum number piece, is there in the Klebsch Gordon, and then there is a non geometric uh, piece, which is kind of the reduced matrix element. Okay, so let's kind of uh, try to figure out how to get the reduced matrix element. Okay, so first thing is that, like, what we will do is we'll write down this Klebsch Gordon. So you look at this expression, this expression tells you that the Klebsch Gordon coefficient is written as the matrix element of SZ divided by the reduced matrix element, right? Is that fine? Hello? 
Yeah. Yeah. So what we'll do is that, like you know, given that this Klebs Gordon is given by matrix element of Sz divided by the reduced matrix element, this Klebs Gordon should be the Klebs Gordon for any vector operator with z projection sandwiched between this state and the vector sandwiched in the reduced matrix element. So what we'll do is we'll choose J, which is a good base operator in the LSJM basis, and we say that Klebs Gordon coefficient is actually the matrix element of JZ in this basis divided by the reduced matrix element of J in this uh, LH, uh, J basis. Okay. After all, it will give you the same thing. It's, a, it's just a geometric information about the spherical tensor. So, which spherical tensor you use is not important really. Okay. So, we'll use this. But we know what is JZ eigen, uh, eigenvalue inside this state, which is just MJ. So we get MJ divided by this reduced matrix element. That is the Klebs Gordon coefficient. Okay. So what we'll do now is we'll use this Klebs Gordon coefficient and plug it back into this expression. So SZ matrix element, therefore, is a reduced matrix element of S times MJ divided by reduced matrix element of J. Okay. So that's why our expression is going to look something like this. Okay. Yeah. Good. So now we want to ask a question. How do we determine this quantity? Okay. So we'll follow the earlier uh, kind of uh, manipulation that we had done uh, a couple of lectures ago. We take the ratios of this. Okay. And we write down, oh, uh, I missed the equality sign. Um, so this uh, matrix element is same as matrix element of J dot S divided by J dot J. Right? Remember, we had done this manipulation earlier. Okay. If you want, I can go back and show it. Uh... Here actually, but I'm not able to look it. Hold on. So what we do uh, do here is yeah. So so here's the exp expression that you want to compute this is equal to this. Okay. So you you write this entire expression as i dot g upon r cube times i dot j kind of piece. Okay. This is the manipulation that we had done earlier. Okay. So same thing. Only difference is that we are doing it in the reduced matrix element. So that means we don't worry about the magnetic projection of it. Okay. But the same uh, thing. Here we used I to kind of uh, make this into a scalar quantity. Uh, what we are doing now is instead using J. Okay. So, so here we are. So what we will do is, in this particular case, we uh, multi uh, take the dot product with j. So you get a j dot s in the numerator and j dot j in the denominator. But j dot j is just j squared. j squared acting on this will give you j into j plus one. So therefore, this matrix element that we want to compute is same as the matrix element, reduced matrix element of j dot s sandwiched between these states divided by j into j plus one. Okay. Of course, there is a M also multiplying here because we are just computing this part. Okay. There's an equality sign sitting around here, which I have missed. Uh, okay. But we know now what to do with J dot S. J dot S can be written in a basis which is uh, in terms of operator, which is diagonal in this basis. And that is that J dot S is equal to minus half times J minus S whole squared minus S squared minus J squared. Okay. You can just expand this. You get a j squared, which will cancel here. You get a s squared, which will cancel here, and minus two times j dot s. 
okay minus 2 times j, j dot s minus sign is scaled by this 2 is scaled by this so this is j, j dot s okay but j minus s is l okay so therefore this expression j dot s is just minus half l squared minus s squared minus j squared okay this is of course something we knew ls coupling uh, was written by writing j squared minus l squared minus s squared by 2 this is the same stuff instead of ls coupling we have j s coupling so we are writing it in that form okay but we know that in the ls uh, j basis l squared s squared and j squared are all diagonal okay and they give you eigen value l into l plus 1 for this since s is the half although i have written s here but in our problem s is half i just write down minus 3 quarters here and it gives you minus j into j plus 1 okay so just take it and put it up here all this factor okay okay so you get the result okay so maybe uh, i have skipped a step looks like okay but what you can do is that you can take this result and put it back uh, into this expression you get minus mj times uh, uh, minus mj by 2 times this entire bracket okay that is the result but before we kind of see that that is the eigenvalue we have to go back and notice one thing that we kind of forgot while doing this thing we are computing the sj matrix element but there is a jz matrix element also so it gives you another mj value okay so therefore besides getting this uh, expression you also have a mj additional factor so therefore you get e b upon 2 m times mj into bracket 1 that is the jz uh, factor and j into j plus 1 minus 3 quarters minus l into l plus 1 upon 2 times j into j plus 1 is this entire object okay 2 times j into j plus 1 is coming from this factor of j into j plus 1 this factor of 2 this minus sign has been soaked up inside to flip things appropriately oh i should have written plus here sorry for that okay this is plus three quarters okay and uh, and a mj value sitting out here okay so that gives you the spectrum and as you can see it does depend on l okay in fact it only depends on l if you uh, do a little more exercise okay and uh, so that's what we'll do now so suppose you look at uh, the change in energy in the basis n l as j m j and look at l value to be j plus one then you can just substitute l is equal to j plus one or you can substitute j is equal to l minus half and uh, manipulate that expression and you'll get the answer minus one over two times l plus one on the other hand if you take uh, j is equal to l plus half then you get plus uh, one over two times l plus one okay so that is the uh, thing that you would see in uh, generated by the uh, weak magnetic field okay of course this would make sense uh, if only if you have already uh, ensured that this splitting is smaller compared to the fine structure splitting okay because that is the assumption that went in while doing this computation because if the if this splitting is not smaller than the fine structure splitting uh, then we would have directly worked uh, in the MLMS basis. It is the fine structure splitting which chooses the MS uh, instead of MLMS basis, it chooses JM basis, okay, uh, because of this n upon j plus half factor, okay. So all these computations which we had to do in the uh, JMJ basis uh, kind of assumed that the magnitude of the magnetic field is not big enough for uh, for the correction to the energy levels uh, compared to the correction generated by say fine structure effects okay fine so uh, if this was not the case if splitting was large then of course we'll have to uh, deal with the degenerate perturbation theory because the levels which have been split by the fine structure effects are not uh, are kind of that that splitting is small compared to the splitting generated by the magnetic field and in that case the magnetic field would be kind of uh, seeing the larger degeneracy uh, of state uh, of 
for a given energy eigenvalue. Okay, in that case, of course, MLMS would be the most suitable basis because then then LZ plus two LZ will just give you eigenvalue ML plus two MS. Okay, and uh, that would be the situation if you are working with very strong magnetic field. Okay. Now, once you, have a, once you do this computation, uh, then of course you'll have to still take the fine structure effect into account. Okay, but the difference is that in the weak magnetic field, you first took the fine structure effect into account, went into the correct basis in which the fine structure spectrum is diagonal, and computed the correction due to the magnetic field, and that is what we got here. But if your magnetic field is very strong, uh, then you should take the magnetic field effect into account first. Okay, and then treat fine structure effect as perturbation over that. Okay, so you'll have to do this computation for the uh, for the fine structure correction after taking in, into account the strong magnetic field correction. Okay, but the thing is that like you know, if you want to study this, then the fine structure effect is kind of easy to compute now. Okay, and the reason why it is easy to compute is because very strong magnetic field. Has lifted the degeneracy for different ML values. There are different energies. Okay, so the entire degeneracy of the problem has been completely lifted by very strong magnetic field, and therefore fine structure effect uh, is kind of uh, like studying non-degenerate perturbation theory. Okay, now of course all this uh, comes with some caveat, and the caveats are the following: that if B is too strong. Then you may have order b squared terms, you know, which are still bigger than the relativistic corrections. Okay, now remember that this b squared is kind of b is always multiplied by e by 2m, so b squared will have some e by 2 uh, m whole squared kind of piece. So there is just there are smaller factors multiplying these quantities, but if magnetic field is just too strong, then that term of order b squared could still be bigger than the relativistic correction and therefore fine structure correction to this spectrum may be subleading effect compared to order b squared correction okay but instead suppose you have a b you have a magnetic field which is just about big enough such that order b terms are bigger than the fine structure uh, corrections but order b squared terms are small okay if that is the case, then in that uh, situation, you compute this correction first, okay? And instead of going for order B squared correction to this spectrum, you can look for the fine structure correction, okay? Uh, now, sir, yes. in which case have you said that we have to do degenerate perturbation theory? Oh, uh, you'll have to do degenerate perturbation theory if the energy splitting generated by the uh, uh, by the perturbation is larger than the energy splitting in the original problem. Okay, in that case, you have to do degenerate perturbation theory. I mean, that is what's happening here also, right? No, in this case, what is happening is that the magnetic field is so strong that fine structure problem, you kind of treat perturbation over this problem. Then the magnetic field uh, problem is, of course, degenerate perturbation theory. But LS plus two is, uh, is uh, sorry, LZ plus two SZ completely lifts the degeneracy. After it lifts, lifts the degeneracy, then the fine structure problem is non-degenerate perturbation theory. Okay. I mean, regardless of which we do first, we should get the yeah. same results, right? No, uh, no, no, no. You are doing different uh, computations. Okay, weak magnetic field result is not the same as a strong magnetic field result. Or maybe uh, that's not what you are saying. If you could scroll above, yeah. Yeah. Here, and then no, the, just the statements that you have written. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, here, your meaning is that what we have calculated right now, the delta being some order one by twelve plus one thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So these and some coefficients. Weak magnetic yeah, yeah. So these weak magnetic field effects. Okay, they are applicable only if you know these splittings. Okay, with this you know E B by two M factors multiplying all of them. Okay, if those values are smaller 
then the fine structure splitting. Yes. Okay. If not, then you cannot do a weak magnetic field uh, computation. Okay. Yeah. So in case it is not so small with respect to the fine structure splitting, we have to do the de degenerate, right? You have to do degenerate perturbation theory for magnetic field problem. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So we will do degenerate perturbation theory for magnetic field problem and treat the uh, fine structure problem as a perturbation over this. So this energy, uh, this problem involving delta H for strong magnetic field, okay, is degenerate perturbation theory computation. Okay, yeah. which is what, which is what we want, right? Because uh, if the splitting is large, then you should do degenerate perturbation theory for the for for this. Right. Yeah, my point was that you have written that we can ignore, uh, like, if if that is not the case, that the non-degenerate results aren't good enough, then we should ignore the fine structure splitting. Yeah, in the beginning, of course, it's not like completely. And then ignored. compute the degenerate perturbation theory results, which will give this delta H. Yes. In the in the case of strong magnetic field, and over that yes. we add on the rel uh, relativistic fine structure. Yes, exactly. But my so you, point was that this is a mathematically like a tool, right? That first we consider a magnetic field uh, implication on the uh, Hamiltonian on the energy states, and then yeah. we add on the next perturbation. Yeah, yeah. We could yeah. have very well done it the other way around, and if it's if the theory is consistent, it should give the same results. No, 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 no. no. Okay, let's put it this way that. If you can do the full calculation, then it will give you the same result, okay? But you are doing this calculation in perturbation theory, right? So you do a first order perturbation theory of this, and then you do a first order perturbation theory of that on that, okay? So you compute this first order correction due to strong magnetic field, okay? Look at the splitting, and then you compute first order correction due to fine structure effect, okay? Now, if you could do all order corrections of the magnetic field and all order corrections of the fine structure uh, effect, then it doesn't matter in which order you do. Okay. I mean, if it matches to all orders, then it should also match to a truncated order, right? No, like... no, obviously not. If that was the case, then the asymptotic expansion wouldn't have would have been perfectly fine all the time, right? We will learn this in differential equation. Asymptotic expansion. I mean, there is one very interesting statement that one can make uh, in differential equation that if you have an asymptotic expansion or, uh, of some solution, okay, analytic continuation of asymptotic expansion is not the same as asymptotic expansion of analytically continued function. Okay, it's exactly the same situation here. Sir, it is like saying the limits don't commute or something yes. like that. Yes, yes, exactly. But why do we get to decide this? Like, which limit to take first? Well, uh, uh, by sheer, I mean, in this particular case, purely by magnitude of which effect is larger, right? I mean, you could have asked the same question as to why don't we do fine structure effect first and the Coulomb effect later? It should give you the same answer, right? But clearly, that's not what will happen in hydrogen atom, right? Yeah, I'm not sure, but okay. Yeah, so, but like, you know, it is true that like, you know, that approximate calculations, okay, uh, I mean, these are all approximate calculations, no? perturbation theory through some order. All order computations, you can kind of swap them around if you wish, okay? But order by order computations may not commute, okay? Uh, like, if I sort of here we have two different sort of things but suppose i have a hamiltonian and to yeah. it add to it i add two terms one is like uh like in the let's say harmonic oscillator i add an x4 term yeah and i add an x6 term x to the okay. power six yes now independently if i didn't have x4 i can compute for x6 up to some order of perturbation yes and similarly if i didn't have x6 i can compute for x4 yeah now, suppose I add them with some lambda with the same parameter, with the same strength, uh, like at okay. least controlling parameter same, the function okay. might be different. Yes. So I can expand in terms of this lambda. 
yes and i'm saying that up to some order in lambda the results shouldn't matter in which way i'm computing because while adding x4 and x6 yeah i can somewhat i am guessing here that i can somewhat treat x4 as a perturbation on the original hamiltonian and on this hamiltonian x6 as a new perturbation yeah but their their values are same right and well they are functions of the same strength parameter yeah yeah then then there is no way of kind of you know deciding which one is larger and which one is smaller yeah Although so you can still decide uh, i mean there is still a way of deciding uh, if you want to ask what is the correction due to x to the 4 uh, versus x to the 6 for small x values okay near x closer to x equal 0 then you will keep x to the 4 and drop x to the 6 okay but if you want to see what is the effect uh, how does the wave function change for large values of x then you will keep x to the 6 and drop x to the 4 yeah okay. but my point Your was the coupling is same when we are considering the change in energy and yeah treat, treating the perturbation term by term like yeah. x4 terms first and then x6 or x6 terms first and then x4 the result shouldn't matter No, I mean, the result should be independent of this order. No, no, not at all. Not at all. If it if that was the case, then you could have just written down both the terms simultaneously and just computed, no? Yeah, that is my point that we should be able to do that. No, but in perturbation theory, it doesn't happen because you know, like for small x, x to the four will dominate over x to the six. For large x, x to the six will dominate over x to the four, right? So there are different asymptotic limits of the wave function. Different terms are contributing actually. Okay, even if you keep the coupling to be same, you know, lambda in front of x to the four and lambda in front of x to the six. When you so this is like this is like in differential equation. If you do a local study around near x equals zero, you will keep only x to the four term and ignore x to the six. If you study the equation near x x equals infinity, you will keep x to the six and ignore x to the four. that is how the computations are done okay and then yeah, you actually you are saying it that somewhere in between like yeah. near x equal 0 okay x4 dominates and we won't see the presence of x6 and yeah. other way around near far away x we won't see the presence of x to the power 4 yeah now if i approach a point in between from the side of 0 and from the side of infinity there yeah. will be a point where i'll see both the effects yes x equals 1 are you trying to say that they will be different from when i approach from x equal 0 and from x equal infinity yes they will you will have to do a correction to kind of match them they they, they won't match as usual you know because the solution that you obtain at infinity would kind of uh, will be well behaved from all the way from infinity to up to say x equals 10 or 15 or some such thing and then it will start diverging away And the solution that you have obtained near x equals zero, it will be well behaved up to say x equals 0.9 or 0.95 or something, and it will again start diverging. And these two divergences would not agree actually. And you will have to do a additional work to match these two solutions in the neighborhood of x equals one. But at least uh, when I keep infinitely many terms in the series, all the terms of the perturbation, and then start yeah. matching. it shouldn't yeah. matter right whether i'm coming from the right or the left yeah uh, uh, well in principle yes in practice no uh, in, in the sense that like uh, the solution that uh, okay uh, it of course depends upon what problem one is looking at but imagine one of the uh, solutions is uh, in the neighborhood of some uh, irregular singularity then that solution has zero radius of con convergence so that solution even if you write on infinite number of terms it is only asymptotic series okay and it is not good enough actually no matter what you do it may have a good convergence but still it won't give you the right answer okay so what you need to do is to go beyond the asymptotic expansion you have to there are various techniques there is something called stokes phenomena which will tell you how the solution jumps around there is some way of some method called borel resummation to get to v sum a asymptotic series and then do a laplace transform to get a compact form answer uh, you need to do a lot of stuff before you actually get the right answer okay in fact perturbation theory is not uh, uh, convergent and in fact in many cases perturbation theory is not even borel summable so you do a borel transform try to sum that you don't even get a finite answer okay you, you have to do some additional work 
uh, over and above simple borel transform to get an answer which is finite so the fact that e even even quantum electrodynamics even the most uh, successful quantum field theory uh, is the perturbation theory is not uh, convergent okay so you need to do additional stuff to actually make sense of the whole stuff the point is that like even if the perturbation theory is not convergent that does not mean that you know computation is done to say uh, second order third order fourth order tenth order in perturbation theory i would start showing divergence they don't okay if you if you go to say like you know 10000th order in perturbation theory then you will see that the results don't seem to agree the, the, those results seem to be larger than say a uh, uh, 50th order in perturbation theory computation and then you clearly see that the series has started diverging then you have to develop new techniques to make sense of those uh, divergent series and uh, that is what i was mentioning in the uh, differential equation class that there is this new method called resurgence which tells you how to make sense of uh, asymptotic series okay so it is not like you know it's not like you, you do this and you like you know everything pops out to be perfectly correct i see it doesn't and in fact in fact you know uh, even more annoyingly uh, if you have a problem in to which you know exact solution then most often you there is from physics point of view there is really nothing to learn from that exact solution you know exact solutions are probably the worst thing that a physicist would want you know uh, although you know i i am kind of exaggerating it there is a Uh, section of uh, physics community who is looking for exact solutions integrable models exactly soluble models and so on what i mean by that is that like you know if you get exact closed form solutions they do not tell much physics they give you mathematically exact uh, result and to understand physics of it often what you do is that you take that exact answer and do asymptotic expansion and then you can give a term by term explanation of what is this term what is that term what is that term you know so physics is actually much more you know uh transparent in the asymptotic expansion than in exact solution okay but this is not to say that like you shouldn't be looking for exact solution at all i mean i am not advocating anything like that okay but uh, physics is hidden in mostly in the asymptotic expansion okay so so in that sense like you know at first order perturbation theory you know it would be kind of difficult to say that you could do this computation in any order and it would have given the same result i mean if it if it did then that would just correspond to the statement that those two operators just commute with each other and therefore you can compute any which way you want okay but that we all know physically that if two operators commute any one of the operators could act first okay but generically if they don't commute then uh, the order is important Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Okay. So, so good. So, if the magnetic field is very strong, then we solve that problem first, and we get this result to the leading order in perturbation theory, and then we uh, put the fine structure uh, effect as a perturbation over that. Okay. But thankfully, for the fine structure problem, this spectrum is totally non-degenerate. Okay. Now. in the weak magnetic field case we were not that lucky because weak magnetic field case uh, before fine structure uh, correction uh, the states were degenerate uh, with large degeneracy because they the energy dependent only on principal quantum number so if n is equal to some value say 2 then l is equal to 0 and l is equal to 1 were all degenerate okay but because of the fine structure constant uh, sorry fine structure uh, correction uh, the term j plus half appeared in the energy spectrum and therefore different j values had con at different energy levels and therefore it had partially lifted that degeneracy but in spite of that the magnetic projections of j were still uh, degenerate and therefore for weak magnetic field the problem was still partially degenerate problem although not completely uh, not fully degenerate problem okay but in the strong magnetic field you have lifted everything okay ml eigen values are different ms eigen values are different 
okay and therefore uh, the fine structure computation is done in completely non degenerate uh, uh, perturbation theory uh, setup okay fine now of course uh, as i was uh, saying this, uh, uh, this that if you have a very strong magnetic field then you of course have to kind of weigh the strength of the magnetic field against the relativistic effects and if the magnetic field is just too strong then you have to kind of continue using higher and higher effect of magnetic fields first okay uh, and then at some sufficiently higher order you may find that like okay relativistic correction sits somewhere in between this and then you look at the relativistic correction okay so what i was trying to argue was that like suppose we don't take that higher magnetic field okay but suppose we take magnetic field high enough so that order b corrections are large but order b square corrections are small compared to the fine structure effect okay then you do this computation which is order b correction okay and then you before you get to into order b squared uh, effect which is like second order in perturbation theory kind of effect you should uh, ask you should check what is the fine structure effect computation okay now of course if this is turns out to be small compared to order b squared then you are again have to do this and then do that calculation okay fine but nevertheless what one would do in strong magnetic field is to treat the fine structure effect uh, perturbatively as against what we did in the weak magnetic field in which we computed fine structure effect first and treated the magnetic uh, field effect external magnetic field effect perturbatively okay okay so so this statement is just uh, to say that like when you are going to solve the fine structure effect problem perturbatively then you would work in a basis in which the strong magnetic field effect is diagonal it has already been computed and that basis of course we know that is mlms basis okay so remember the fine structure uh, computation the correct basis was actually jmj basis okay but in the strong magnetic field the fine structure is being treated perturbatively and therefore you will work with mlms basis and compute the uh, fine structure effect okay fine so we have said all this already okay now what the next thing that we can do is to study the effect of time independent electric field okay so we apply external electric field to the atom and we want to study uh, what happens to the spectrum okay so again we can treat uh, this problem this is what is called the stark effect and we can just treat this problem in two limits uh, again kind of some extreme cases one is when the electric field is weak and in that case of course we will first do the fine structure uh, splitting into account and then study the effect of electric field okay the other extreme of that is to have very strong electric field and in that case we ignore the fine structure splitting and we work with the original hydrogen schrodinger problem of for hydrogen atom and uh, study the spectrum uh, which is with, with that kind of energy uh, uh, that kind of non uh, unperturbed energy spectrum okay so let's look at the strong electric field case first okay in this particular case so we just look at that okay so since this is going to generate large splitting we will ignore the fine structure splitting and we will concentrate only the effect of strong electric field on the uh, original hydrogen atom problem okay so in that case the hamiltonian would be uh, delta h is equal to e times e times z where we have chosen the electric field to be in that direction okay otherwise it would have been some r vector or some such thing e dot r kind of thing okay fine so this is purely convenience in fact uh, yeah more than convenience it it makes computation easier actually okay but uh, it really doesn't matter if you choose it in any direction you can always you know uh, that in quantum mechanics you can always use euler angle rotation uh, and choose any vector and rotate it in some z direction so you can eventually bring the problem back to this particular form so it doesn't matter really okay is it fine okay 
Fine. So as we uh, saw in the case of magnetic field, uh, if we ignore the uh, fine structure splitting, then the good basis would have been MLMS basis. Okay. And the MLMS basis, uh, remember, we are ignoring fine structure splitting. So therefore, only important quantum number as far as the energy spectrum is concerned is N principal quantum number. Okay. For a given value of principal quantum number, L can take value from 0, all the 0, 1, 2 integer values all the way up to N minus 1. And for every L value, ML can take minus L to plus L values. Okay. So that is the kind of spectrum. Uh, S is, of course, half, so MS can take plus or minus half that. And all these quantum numbers do, do not figure in the energy spectrum because only quantity that appears in the energy spectrum is N. Uh, hydrogen atom spectrum is just proportional to 1 over n squared. Okay, So for a given n value, you have this L degeneracy. For every L value, there is, this is the ML degeneracy. And that should be multiplied by 2 because of the MS degeneracy. Okay, So all these states are degenerate. And we have to kind of uh, study the matrix element of Z. Okay, Because E times E, they are constants. You know, we are taking uniform electric field. Okay, so this just pulls out. Z is a coordinate, and that we want to treat as an as an operator and compute its matrix element. Okay, so this matrix element has to be computed in this degenerate problem. Okay, fine. Now, SZ, whose eigenvalues are MS, okay, uh, you know, and LZ, whose eigenvalues are ML. These operators commute with Z, okay? Because you know these op operators uh, are uh, related to rotation about Z-axis, okay? Which of course leaves Z in itself invariant, okay? So therefore, Z cannot change the ML eigenvalues as well as it cannot change the MS eigenvalues, okay? So therefore, when we want to compute the matrix element uh, of Z, okay, uh, then in the bra and Kate states we'll keep the ML and MS values to be same because that is not uh, you know, capable of changing the ML MS values. Equivalently, Z could be thought of as the, uh, as, I mean, as a component of a vector, uh, in this case, R vector, and R vector could be decomposed into uh, the, uh, the plus component, the minus component, and the zeroth component, and the zeroth component of that R vector is Z. Okay. Uh, typically, we that's how we say x and y component can be written x, x plus i y and x minus i y, which are the plus and minus components, and the z component is what is called a zeroth component. Okay. So because it's a zeroth component, it cannot change these values of ML and MS. Okay. Uh, completely follows from Clash Garden coefficients. Okay. Good. But a, but z is a vector. And because it's a vector, you can think of that as a spherical vector object, and therefore it should change the L value. Okay, so it will mix the L eigenvalues, and because it's a vector, it can change the L eigenvalue by plus one, or it can hold the L eigenvalue to be same, or it can take the L eigenvalue to reduce by one. Okay, this is the same same statement as if you take two angular momenta L1 and L2, then the total angular momentum by product rule is L1 plus L2, L1 plus L2 minus 1, L1 plus L2 minus 2, dot, 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 all the way up to mod of L1 minus L2, which is what this statement is, okay? That it can take L value, it can take it up by 1 because it's a vector operator, or it can keep it, keep the value to be same, or it can reduce it by 1, okay? This reduction by 1 would happen only if the L value is minimally 1. If L value is 0, then of course this term doesn't exist because the lowest value of, of angular momentum product rule is mod of L1 minus L2. Okay, So if mod of L1 minus L2 is, uh, if L1 is 0, then L1 minus L2 is just L2 actually. Okay. Fine. So, However, you know, there's additional uh, thing, uh, which is that the original hydrogen atom problem, uh, which was written <coughs> with the kinetic term, which we used, uh, we wrote it in the spherical polar coordinate system. 
plus, I mean, we, we, we could have written it in any coordinate system, really, but uh, we spherical polar was convenient coordinate system, and the Coulomb potential was one over r, okay, with some minus e times some uh, minus z times c and uh, stuff like that. Uh, but it was one over r, and this but this entire problem has a symmetry that if you take x vector to minus x vector, this uh, Schrodinger equation was invariant. That symmetry was referred to as the Parigi transformation, and that Parigi transformation uh, is a symmetry of this entire spectrum. Okay, so if you turn on a electric field, then Z is of course not parity invariant. Okay, this is odd under parity. Okay, but the original problem is parity invariant, and therefore the correction generated by Z okay, would be non-zero only if L is plus or minus one, okay, but not L, uh, L is equal to, I mean, not the transition from L to L, okay, simply because Z has odd parity, and therefore, if it shifts the L value by one, it takes care of the parity property of Z, okay, otherwise it would kind of violate parity, okay, that the expression has odd parity, uh, whereas the final, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the the state on which Z acts has odd parity, and Z acts on that which is uh, itself is odd parity, uh, and you cap it with another state which is odd parity, and that wouldn't work. Okay, it would violate parity. Okay, so therefore, parity of the 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 operator Z tells you that L is L to L transition wouldn't happen. Okay, so that is interesting because. Yet another typo. Okay. Okay. Uh, I know what I want to say, but it is not there. Okay. So, but from what we learn here is that if you have a matrix element like this, then that would tell you that L prime is equal to L plus or minus one. Okay. That's what it is supposed to be. Okay. So, uh, so only those cases that this matrix element would be non-zero. Okay, otherwise it would just vanish. Okay, so let's consider some simple cases. Suppose we look at the ground state. Okay, ground state corresponds to n is equal to one. And n is equal to one, remember L takes value all the way up to n minus one, so therefore only L is equal to zero state allowed. Okay, that is the only state that uh, occurs for the ground state. And in that case, Z being a vector operator will map L is equal to zero to L is equal to one. Okay, that is this statement. Okay. If L is equal to zero, it cannot do this. It can give you L is equal to zero and L is equal to one, but zero to zero transition cannot happen. So therefore, it would do this. But L is equal to one doesn't exist for N is equal to one, okay? And therefore, uh, the correction is zero, okay? So it will not uh, correct the ground state uh, uh, energy, okay? To leading order in perturbation theory, of course, okay? The second order perturbation theory, of course, is a different story because then you, you know that you have to sandwich a complete set of states between the two perturbation Hamiltonian, and then of course you can take this state to some other state, and from that some other state you can go back to the same state, and you can get a correction. Okay. So when we say this delta is equal to zero, we mean delta is equal to zero to leading order in perturbation theory. Okay. So let's consider n is equal to two, okay? But let me, before we consider that, is this okay? Modulo, of course, uh, typos. Hello? Are we connected? Yeah. Oh, yes. yeah, okay, oh, okay, okay, thanks. Okay, so uh, uh, is this fine? Yes, sir. Yeah, so let's go to the next one, uh, just to kind of get a picture of what is happening. Okay. So if you consider n is equal to two, then L is L can take value zero and one. And uh, I have written it in kind of compact uh, form, which is not good, but uh, nevertheless, ML can take value zero for L is equal to zero. And ML can take value zero and plus minus one for L is equal to one. That's what I mean by ML taking this set of values. 
Okay, MS of course will take same plus or minus half simply because you are looking at single electron problem. Okay, fine. But we I have already uh, concluded one uh, result, and that is where was that? That it commutes the, this matrix element commutes with SZ and LZ, and therefore it cannot change ML and MS values, but it can change L value. Okay, so therefore at n equals two we have a uh, have a little more option than n equals one case. And the option is the following, that MS value has to be preserved. Okay, so that is something you can't do much with. ML value also has to be preserved. Okay, but L value has to change. Why? Because that's what we concluded, that L value has to change. Now, if you have to change the L value in the, in the matrix element, then uh, it has to go from L is equal to zero to one or vice versa. Now this can happen holding ML equals ML to be fixed, then only way these two states could mix is if ML value is zero. So ML value plus or minus one, okay, are not affected by this uh, perturbation to leading order in perturbation theory, okay? So if you want to write down this expression, you will see it in this uh, particular way that L, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so L is equal to zero, ML is equal to zero state, and L is equal to one and ML is equal to zero states can mix, okay? But the states with L is equal to one and ML not equal to zero, whether it is plus one or minus one, it doesn't matter, okay? The matrix element would vanish, okay? Whether it's a matrix element of state with L is equal to one, ML is equal to one with itself, or L is equal to one, ML equals minus one with L is equal to one, ML equals one, it doesn't matter. Okay, if ML values are different, the matrix element is zero anyway. But if ML values are same, also the matrix element would be, would be zero simply because L value remains same. Okay, fine. Now, remember one thing that if you look at pure angular momentum uh, rule, then purely angular momentum uh, rule would tell you that all these values are allowed. Okay, L is equal to L transiting to L plus one, L going to L, L minus one, and L remaining what it is, okay? All these three values are allowed by angular momentum addition rule, okay? It is a parity which kills the L to L transition, okay? So therefore, uh, the matrix element would be, would be allowed between these states with themselves if you only looked at the angular momentum algebra, okay? It's the parity of the perturbation which is important. Okay, now here is the uh, kind of matrix form of the problem. Okay, I, I think it is shot out. I'll have to do something to bring it in. Um, but uh, so here's the thing that the parity argument therefore tells us that the diagonal matrix elements will always vanish because no state has matrix element with itself. Okay, but a state would have a matrix element with some other state. So the non-vanishing matrix elements are like this. So it's a little cryptic language, but n is equal to two, l is equal to zero, s, I could have written half here, but doesn't matter. Okay, ml is equal to zero. For l is equal to zero, ml is zero is the only possibility. And ms value, you sandwich the perturbation between this state and a state which is n is equal to two, l is equal to one. Okay, so you see the change in l value, s remains same. Magnetic quantum number for our orbital angular momentum remains same because that is not something which Z would change. And MS also remains same, okay? The, the matrix element here is just a complex conjugate of this. You can see that two one is on this side and two zero is on the other side, okay? Uh, although it has gone out of the uh, screen, uh, it's just you take a star of this and put it there, okay? Fine. So we want to compute this matrix element, okay? So what we'll do is uh, we will write Z uh, in terms of R cos theta, okay? And once you write it in terms of R cos theta, then you have, you can clearly see that you have to do two computations. Uh, for R, you'll have to do the radial part, you'll need a radial part of the wave function, and you want to compute the matrix element of R. And for cos theta, you'll have to compute the uh, angular part of the wave function and compute the expectation value uh, or other 
matrix element of cos theta. Okay, so let's first start with the radial part. So radial part, remember, the state is between uh, n equals two l is equal to one and n equals two l equals zero. So therefore, the computation is e times e, which is the factor which is just going to sit outside. Okay, and the integral dr times r squared. This is just the integration measure. R21, which is this quantity, times R, which is the quantity coming from Z, and R20, which is this state. Okay. Remember the radial part of the wave functions are real, so therefore you don't have to put a star on anything. Okay. And you could therefore order any which way you want. Okay. Uh, well, even if you had put star, you could have written any which way you wanted. Okay. But yeah, so this is the thing. Okay. Uh, Divided by, of course, normalizations of both the wave functions. Okay, so these are just normalization factors: R21 normalization and R20 normalization. Okay. Similarly, for the angular part, you will do the same thing. That you will sandwich. Remember, this is the one zero state, and this is the zero zero state. Okay. So we will kind of one zero state is y one zero, and zero zero state is y zero zero. Okay. So we know what uh, these quantities are. They are actually now. Yeah, if you use normalized form, then you don't even have to write down this denominator piece. Okay, so it's like for example, y zero zero normalization is like one over square root four pi. If you knew that, then you don't have to do anything. Okay, but if you don't know it, then you can write y zero zero to be one kind of you know, and then compute it to by putting the factor downstairs. In this case, of course, uh, sine theta sorry d theta d phi uh, factor. Uh, and cos theta is the matrix element coming from Z. Okay, and this is what we want to compute. Okay, so here's an exercise, and I think I'll stop after showing the exercise. That you can combine these two pieces, okay, the radial part and the angular part. And you can show that this matrix element uh, is given by this number, okay, three times e times the electric field upon Z e squared. Okay. So only important quantity here is minus three, really. Okay, everything else is kind of easy to guess uh, because e times e is sitting around, which just goes and sits there. Z is a length scale, and only length scale that you have in uh, quantum mechanics problem is Bohr radius. Okay, and uh, Bohr radius is just one over Z e squared m. So e times e upon Z e squared m is already fixed. Okay, only thing that you have to determine is by doing all this exercise, is to get this factor right. Okay, you can check that. Okay, so I think I'll stop here. Any questions?